Hi, I'm Takoa De Silva with Sprott Global Resource Investments, and I'm sitting down here today with Brent Cook of uh, Exploration Insights. Brent, good to see you. Thank you. Likewise. Yeah, uh, it's a, a pleasure to have you here. I, I'm, I'm excited to be talking to you uh, for the first time here in an interview, and uh, for the person watching, uh, your commentary, which I want to ask you about here in just a second in Exploration Insights, is uh, from what I've seen of your work, it's, it's my favorite period when it comes to geology and uh, to looking at the market from that perspective. So for the person watching, in case they're new to resources, to the conversation, tell us a little bit about yourself and that um, um, and your commentary that you produce. Yeah, I, I guess I call myself an economic geologist. I've been doing this for 30 odd years now. Uh, up until I joined Rick Rule in 97, I was a consultant. I worked for most, most of the major mining companies, anything from grassroots you know, exploration, conceptual stuff through to bankable feasibilities and such. Uh, I was involved in the privatization of ZCCM in Zambia and, uh, and the Resilient Company as well. Uh, lived, lived in, what, four countries, uh, worked in 60 countries. So I've got, and I've worked on everything. So I've got, you know, I've built up that background. And then working with Rick uh, was a whole new experience in that, you know, there's one thing to be no geology, but to actually make money at it, it's a completely different thing. So I learned, you know, the money side of things the hard way from Rick. Uh, and so now what I do is I write an investment letter just basically about what I'm doing with my money in this sector, why I'm doing it, what I'm expecting, what I'm seeing in, in, in you know, bigger picture in terms of the, the mining business, that sort of thing. I want to ask you a little bit more about um what you've seen and, and where you've spent most of your career in terms of places of the world and, and some uh, memories that may come to mind. But before I do that, uh, there's uh, an, an article I want to point your uh, attention to, if I could, which you published. It, it's called Insights into the Discovery Process. And, um, you know, I, I, I have to tell you that for my first six months of working with Rick at Sprout Global, I had a number of articles and things taped up on the wall, and I read them every single morning, you know, as I started my day. This was one of them, and in particular, the passage, all one has to do to make serious money is to accumulate shares in the best deposits and most competent explorers and wait. And that's the full quote. And uh, there are a number of questions that you proposed or that you posed at the end of at the end of that article. I'm wondering if you can tell our person watching those questions and then the reasoning behind that statement. Yeah, well, it's obviously a lot easier said than done. <laughs> um, and that article's on my website. All my everything I've uh, published that's for public consumption is on my website. Uh, I think what you really need to do if you're going to get involved in this sector, uh, especially the early stage exploration, is you need to understand what the company is actually looking for, what it looks like, uh, what the dimensions are, what the grade characteristics are, uh, what the alteration features are, uh, what the, the trace elements are, you know, basically what this thing looks like that they're looking for so that you can evaluate the results as they come in. Um, more importantly, you need to make sure the company knows what they're looking for. That's the biggest mistake I see in, in, you know, in this junior sector is the guys looking, they're mostly, you know, for the most part, they're just a treasure hunt. A uh, bunch of scientists out there on a treasure hunt, drilling holes to see what's down there. Um, if the company really doesn't know what they're looking for, looks like, how, do they, how can they know when to quit or when to keep going or how to rejug, rejigger their exploration? Um, so I think that's the really the important thing you've got to understand and the company's got to understand. And we know that 99 out of 100 prospects end up uneconomic with nothing. So our job as, a, as investors in this sector is to find the fatal flaw as quickly as possible and get out of the way. And I've made really good money on stocks that, you know, initial drilling looked good, the stock ramped up, it kept looking good, and then you start saying, well, wait, you start recognizing as the news comes out that that comes away, there's a problem here, be it metallurgy, be it size, be it, you know, strip ratio, whatever. And we've made really good money on stuff that ultimately went back down to here because, you know, we're ahead of the crowd, I guess. So I think that's probably the most important thing someone needs to do is understand that what their company's looking for and make sure the company knows what they're looking for. So, uh, Brent, uh, could it be safe to say that then in some instances when the fatal flaw begins to present itself, as it becomes obvious, if it does, that a management team may realize it themselves, but in the hopes of finding treasure somewhere under the ground, they may continue to pursue it? Yeah, no, for sure, that happens a lot. I mean, 
Geologists on the whole are very optimistic people and, and they're dreamers and, and, and they've got to be because your odds are so poor at making a discovery. Um, so yeah, they continue to hope uh, and don't recognize when things are going wrong or say, well, if it's not here, it's got to be here. And I think on average, you know, I'm not, I don't have any stats on this, but I would say 20% of discoveries are pure luck and the other 80%, some luck is involved. So that happens, but I think the other factor, and this is probably the, the, the worst thing about it is, this is a, you know, they're getting paid. The company, this is the company's business. They're selling shares, getting paid to explore this project. And they come to you and say, we've got this real hot project in Nevada. Give us some money, drill it, we're gonna drill it. And if it comes back bad, they're gonna come and say, look, sorry, it didn't work. They're gonna say, we think it's over here. Can I have some more money? And, and, and that's a real issue. That happens a lot. I'm, I'm sure you see that as well. Yeah, that's kind of funny. It reminds me of that old saying of bacon and eggs. The uh, chicken was involved, but the pig was committed. Uh, <laughs> they take home the salary, but um, guaranteed, but the investor may or may not ever see their money again. Yeah, it was, it's a lot. There's what Rick calls these lifestyle companies. There's, there's quite a few of them, too many. But on the other hand, there's some excellent, excellent people doing really good work in this sector. Yeah. And I want to trans transition over to the idea of uh, maybe a geological snapshot of the world, because when we talk about exploration, we have a lot of these you know, memories of uh, previous successes, huge, and w there have been a few over the last 10 to 15 years, but it seems like, according to the data, uh, discoveries uh, peaked in the early 90s and have been gradually declining, if I got that right? And it's becoming a more and more dangerous business with just about the same number of players uh, that are out looking for uh, resources? Yeah, we, the, this, uh, certainly in the gold sector, I think and across the board, in, in the mid-90s, uh, discovered ounces peaked. Uh, that was about the peak. And since then, it's, you know, it's kind of been heading down like that. Uh, we're now producing, on average, I think 90 million ounces a year. We're not finding anywhere near 90 million ounces a year to replace it. So uh, discoveries are down significantly. I think the reason is, uh, in, in the you know, late 80s, 90s, the whole world opened up to us. Africa opened up, South America opened up, Eurasia opened up, you know, new governments, and, and so there were deposits basically sitting on surface, and so it wasn't that hard to find them. But now we've covered that, and we've got Landsat data that's, you know, we've looked at most everything. So most of what we're looking for now is blind, meaning it's, it's under cover, you cannot see it from the surface. So you've got to use esoteric techniques, geophysics, you know, trace element ge geochemistry, uh, that sort of thing, to try and target in on where to look for this, you know, where to, where to explore, where to drill. And so, just because of that, the odds are worse, right? It's also more expensive, because you're drilling blind, and even worse, the, it comes to the fact that, on the whole, there's, let's say, for every 10 gold deposits grading one gram a ton, there's one deposit grading two and a half grams per ton. So as we're drilling, you know, exploring blind, we're gonna find 10 of those one gram deposits for every two and a half gram deposit. Yet, at 200 meters depth, one gram doesn't make sense. So our success rate is going down as well. So that's, that's a real, real issue. Um, and I don't think it's gonna get better. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on uh, technology and the use of it, uh, airborne surveys? Uh, I see a lot of maps with colored blobs in the middle where management teams say, you know, uh, we're going to explore the blue area because the blue area has, has the gold. Exactly. Right? Uh, what are your thoughts there? Oh, they're, they're certainly helpful, uh, certainly helpful. But you, you got to realize it's not, those things don't detect mineralization per se. They detect differences in rock, uh, be it alteration, mineralization, uh, different rock types. So you, what you're looking at is, diff is contrast between two or three rock types. And that's all you're really seeing. And then you're interpreting that, uh, okay, that, that blue blob represents uh, magnetite destruction, which represents there was a hydrothermal system there that destroyed the magma, and so it might be a porphyry copper. So it's helpful in that sense, but it's not a given. I mean, and you do a geophysical survey, you're guaranteed an anomaly. <laughs> but you're not guaranteed a deposit. <laughs> and uh, I want to ask you about people now for a moment. And um, I guess the context I want to give it is that I, I had a short conversation with you yesterday and another gentleman who has been responsible for some real serious 
uh, I believe you could define as discovery throughout his career, geologist, and you noted that uh, a lot of geologists today prefer desktop uh, ge uh, uh, exploration. And on, on top of that, I had a conversation with a, um, a person yesterday who noted that uh, uh, she prefers to explore using uh, a mouse, um, clicking, and uh, really doesn't like going out on the field very much anymore. Yeah. But that's sort of what her job title was. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can uh, talk to this concept. Um. That, that, is, that is a real problem as well. People uh, have gotten much more uh, reliant on technology and, and the computer and you can do all this stuff so quickly and produce these maps but bottom line um, it's actually going out there boots on the ground thinking about what you're seeing and mapping and it's the real value in any exploration company is you know what's between here and if you're not out in the field thinking about those things you you don't you don't find things for the most part. So that's a real issue. A lot of these companies are that way. Um, it's really about boots on the ground. And, and when you do, a, you know, this might be more detailed than you want to know, but when, when you're out mapping as a geologist, you're mapping, you map in outcrop, all right? This is what you're seeing on that outcrop. You put the data on there, strike, dip, whatever, and then there's nothing for 100 meters and there's another outcrop. And you put that data on there. And that's what the map should consist of. And then the interpretation on top of it. But what's happened these days is, it gets thrown into a computer, and the computer puts out this map with just colors. And so there's no data, and so there's no, the next person to look at it has no insights into what the geologist was thinking. So anyway, that's, that's you know, a pet peeve of mine, but that's a real issue. Brent, are there any stories that come to mind of a, of a geo who went out and, and just did some really amazing groundwork, and as a result of that, uh, was able to complete a discovery of some kind? Oh, there's lots. I would say most discoveries result from that. Um, the Oyotogo Oye discovery in, in Mongolia, uh, interpreting, you know, interpreting the surface and projecting what might be at depth based on what you see at surface. Uh, most discoveries are that way. Mm -hmm. uh, could you give us details uh, that um, maybe that come to mind, anecdotes of any friends of yours that uh, went out and, and just had some real coincidences where they were doing the work and got lucky at the same time, uh, I guess because they were out there and uh, yeah. working hard. Um, well, certainly, I, I gave an experience, you know, personally. Um, I was, uh, in the 80s, I was working in, in Honduras, and the concept was I'm going out looking at all these hot spring systems. Um, and it went throughout the country and, and, and uh, you know, checked them out. I put some claims on a few of them. One was this big, you know, hot spring center quartz thing. Uh, not much geochemistry there, and so it was kind of a bummer. But then drove around to the other side to think about it and saw some alteration, and that's turned out to be where the deposit was. Now, unfortunately, uh, at that point, I didn't have the financial wherewithal to get any more money backing. So, I, uh, you know, somebody else actually eventually staked it and made a mine of it. Uh, but, but that's how those things work. I mean, I can give you an example of Mirasol in, in Argentina. Uh, they had all this airborne data they're working with, uh, Landsat data, and they're thinking that they spent a lot of time on the field checking out what they're seeing, you know, from the satellite on the ground. And there's one area of the map that was under a cloud. And so, you know, they're following their ideas, came across, and under that cloud on the, in their photo was just as great big veins sticking out of the, out of the ground. And, and so that was a success story as well. Turned into a silver deposit. And they wouldn't have been able to discover that had they not gotten out, put their boots on, and actually walked around and, exactly. and did the work, right? and thought about it, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And just as a, as a final question, what are your thoughts here on the bottoming process of this market? Uh, how, how far into it are we? How much left do we have to go? Uh, if you could, I guess, go off gut instinct compared to what you've seen in the over the last few decades. In, in, in my year-end letter, um, you know, I talked about what I think this year is going to be like. And I still think this year is going to be better than last. I don't think it's going to be a lot better. Uh, we've still got a lot of, a lot of uh, zombie companies to work through that are going to go bust. The mining, major mining companies are decreasing their costs, but what they're really doing is increasing their costs into the future. They're pushing costs into the future. Uh, that's got to be resolved. Um, but my sense is that we are in a bottoming process. I don't think it's going to get a lot worse, you know. Um, 
and I have no doubt that looking two, three years out, these major mining companies are going to wake up to the fact that they shut down exploration, they shut down development, they've got nothing in the pipeline, and all of a sudden the analysts that are now saying, cut your costs, are saying, yeah, but you don't have any ore. Uh, so that's really where I want to be, is right now, and that's your first question I went to that, is what you want to do is just identify the properties and the people that can last through this down period and will come out on the end with the very few quality discoveries that are out there. That's all you've got to do. How many Simple, would, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> How many would you say are out there, those, those types of deposits you're, you're talking about right now? Development stage in some form that there's, are of the quality that... Yeah, there's probably six projects right now, gold, gold projects, that are being developed that I think are going to probably work, uh, held by junior companies. I'm not talking about, you know, majors. Um, in terms of companies that are competent, you know, we've got something like 1,500 listed on the Vancouver Exchange. I would say probably, you know, honestly, 20% of them are companies that I would, you know, consider putting my money into. 20% out of the 1,500? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Maybe 25. Yeah. But, you know, I don't have to buy everything because it's, you know, I'm just dealing with my money. Like my portfolio, I try and keep it to 20 or less. And I think that's something, you know, investors should do as well. Uh, if you have too many stocks, you forget why you bought them and you end up, you know, they go up, they go down, you go, what? <laughs> now you start hoping that it's going to go back up for no reason at all. So that's, you know, that's, that's my philosophy anyway. All right, well, Brent, in, uh, winding down, is there anything you think we may have missed? No, not really. This, this, it, we cover a lot of topics. I think on my website, there's a number of things I've written. Um, it's explorationinsights.com. Um, but no, this, is, this has been good. Thank you so much. All right, Brent Cook, uh, geologist and publisher of the Exploration Insights. Thanks for sharing your comments with us. You're welcome.